All right, praise the Lord, everyone. I'd like to welcome you here today. We are going to do an expose on witchcraft, but actually it's a little different than I usually do, and of course I've traveled coast to coast and I've done this uh, throughout the United States. This is going to be a little different than anything I've ever done before, and you can tell by the title, how can I tell if I'm a witch? I know that sounds a little strange, but witchcraft has so completely taken over our country and, and the world, but primarily the United States, that most people are somehow involved in witchcraft and don't even think about it that way or know about it. What we're going to do today is we're going to look at what witches do, how they think, all of those things, because really, witchcraft is not just casting spells and doing incantations and all of that sort of thing. Witchcraft, first of all, is a way of thinking. And that's something that I want to get across to us, first of all. But before we do anything else, we need to pray and ask the Lord to help us. Father in heaven, we come to thee in prayer this afternoon, thanking thee that we can be here, that we can look at this subject that has so many people in bondage, that has so many people captivated, O oh Lord, in Satan's domain. Lord, I pray that thou wouldst help us now as we go into this subject, that we would be attentive to hear and be thankful, Lord, for thy delivering and saving power. I pray, O oh Lord, that as a result of what is done here today, many people will come out of the occult and come out of Babylon and come out of witchcraft and Freemasonry and all those things involved. Lord, I pray that thou wouldst bring forth deliverance as a result of this presentation today. And, O oh Lord, we also ask that thou wouldst be with us to give us strength and power over all the powers of darkness, taking the authority of thy holy name, Lord Jesus, and of the power of thy saving blood, I now bind, rebuke, cast out every unclean spirit, every force of darkness, every hindering power, breaking every hex, vex, and curse, and everything that would be sent against thy word, thy people, and thy kingdom. O oh Lord, let victory prevail. Let the power of the blood of Jesus prevail. And I pray, O oh God, that thou wouldst help us now to reach out to thee in faith and be thankful, O oh Lord, for thy saving power when we can see what we have been brought out of. And, O oh Lord, we know we've come out of darkness and into thy marvelous light. And now, Lord, make every evil spirit powerless to interfere in any way and let the victory of the blood of Jesus prevail. And we thank thee for it in Jesus' name. Amen. There, now that done, now we can move on. As you can see, the title is, How Can I Tell If I'm a Witch? Now, we're going to start out with some scripture. Deuteronomy 18, verses 9 through 14. And these are some very, very powerful verses. It says, When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. Notice how forcefully the Lord is making this uh, point. You will not, you just will not do what these nations are doing, these abominations. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch. Lo and behold, the word witch is found in the Bible. So is witchcraft. As a matter of fact, we can think of one place where Jezebel was called a witch, and her witchcrafts were many. And so it goes on and says, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord, and because of these abominations the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. Not just good enough, but thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. All right? For these nations which thou shalt possess hearkened unto observers of times and unto diviners. But as for thee, 
The Lord thy God hath not suffered thee so to do. Now, he gives us a list of do nots. And I can tell you that every one of these things are being done en masse in the United States today. First of all, let's just look at what he's saying here. The Lord is saying that we are not, there shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire. And he mentions divination, observer of times, an enchanter, a witch, a charmer, consulter with familiar spirits, a wizard, a necromancer. You know, we're getting awfully close to Halloween, aren't we? Are there any people at all that get involved with the dark side of things this time of the year? Well, actually, it's all during the year, but it's concentrated at the end of October because that's the beginning of the old Celtic year. It's New Year's Day for Wiccan witches. There are many different kinds of witches and a lot of different denominations. You know, just like you have different kinds of Baptists and Lutherans and Methodists and so forth. In witchcraft, you've got the Church of Wicca, the Wicca Church of America, the Church of All Worlds, the Holy Order of the Garter, the Gardnerian Brotherhood, the Alexandrian Brotherhood, and all kinds of sisterhoods and covens, and there are many, many different branches of witchcraft. But now the Lord said, he mentions here, to not have, it is not to be that you'd have your children pass through the fire. One of the things that witches do, and they do this especially at Beltane, which is May 1st, they believe that for good luck, luck, a word derived from the word Lucifer, luck. How many times do people say good luck to you or good luck with this? They're saying Lucifer be with you. Well, you don't want that. All right, but that's just part of our vernacular, part of our vocabulary. As a matter of fact, if we use words and we don't know what they mean, they're not really in our vocabulary, are they? We should always draw a parameter around the words that we use and be able to uh, explain what they mean. To define them. But anyway, at Beltane, they build a fire and they jump over the fire. Do you ever hear the little nursery rhyme, Jack be nimble, Jack be quick, Jack jump over the candlestick? That came from the Beltane bale fires because the fire is one of the elements and it is one of the elements in witchcraft. Earth, wind, water, fire, and then of course spirit is the fifth one. But Fire is one of them that uh, witches believe is the presence of the sun god on earth. Now, witches worship the sun, the moon, the planets. That's why they have to have astrology to practice their craft. But to have your son or daughter pass through the fire. Now, strangely enough, every devout Catholic believes in passing through the fire. A purgatory that when you kick the bucket and assume room temperature, you go to purgatory. Unless you're a pope and they turn you into a saint after you're dead, put you in a box and do their little canonization, then, of course, you go to heaven. You can skip purgatory. Or, if you are wearing a scapular, that little leather uh, piece that you wear around your neck, blessed by some bishop or monsignor or someone, and then if you die wearing a scapular, every Saturday night, St. Joseph goes into purgatory, walks through the flames to see how many people are wearing a scapular. And if you're wearing one, he takes you directly to heaven. Now, if you can get people to believe that, you can sell a lot of scapulars. And you can get a good price for them, too, if you can get people to believe it. Unfortunately, there are a billion people who do. And so there's quite a market for scapulars. Anyway, sometimes I wonder how many people really believe it or just embrace it as part of the religion itself. But anyway, we have the uh, activity of passing through the fire whether it be jumping over a bale fire or believing in purgatory or even fire walking. We have people, and there are thousands of them, including Bill Clinton's best friend, 
And, you know, there are others in high levels of government. They'll put burning coals down and walk barefoot across them and not get burned. Now, that just is impossible, isn't it, unless you're walking with the spirit of the devil or some occult force is temporarily shielding you for a purpose. But whatever, having something to do with the fire of passing through it or into it, whether it be gazing into the flame of a candle, and later on we'll find, about, find out about birthdays too, but we'll save that for later. But all of this fire activity is forbidden by God. In fact, uh, we'll find that on, on Beltane, they don't only have the Baal fire, but the, the opposite cross-quarter Sabbath, which is Halloween, the Druids would always have a big fire at Stonehenge. They have done, this is going back to the Middle Ages now, they've done human sacrifice, and because they literally burned their victims on the altars of Stonehenge, they called it a bone fire. Now, from that you get the word bonfire. What they would do then is everybody had to put their hearths out all through the English countryside and relight the hearths from the fire of human sacrifice in order to assure them a prosperous winter. All right? So witchcraft is a pretty ugly thing. Now, he says that they're not to use divination. Divination is any kind of fortune telling, whether it be reading tea leaves, looking into a crystal ball, which is called scrying, or reading the bumps in the head, the lines of the palm of the hand, using astrology, anything that you use. A pendulum is another way people divine uh, the casting of the, the rune signs, the laying of the tarot cards and the two arcans, and so forth. Any of this sort of thing is forbidden as divination. We're not to do it. Any charm bracelets, any special jewelry, you know, for good luck. You know, you've got these, and uh, Syria, lucky charms? Hmm? How about that one? Or, you know, I used to... Years ago, when I was still watching television and on, on Saturday morning, this was many, many years ago, I remember that the uh, cereal companies would always have a lot of ads on because they had all the sugar-coated cereal and wanted parents to buy it. The children were watching, oh, mom, get me some of that, you know? And they, had, uh, they showed children pouring alphabet cereal into a bowl, putting milk on it, and then the children were asking the bowl of cereal questions. And what they had is a liquid Ouija board there. And then they showed the letters moving around to form the answers. They were teaching the children divination. How to think like a witch. If you can get people to think like a witch, you can turn them into a witch. And when the powers of Antichrist really begin to take over in this country, and it becomes obvious, people are already going to be acclimated in their minds toward witchcraft. That's why all of the hospitals and therapeutic centers and all that are teaching meditation, transcendental meditation, a visualization, all these different things to teach you to think like a witch. Anyway, any form of divination or fortune telling is forbidden. That word divination in classical Latin is Vaticanus, from which you get the word Vatican. Hmm. All right? Now, it says an observer of times. That is an astrologer. One who will mark their time of birth, draw horoscopes, look at world events, and literally time everything according to the motion of the planets through 12 signs called the zodiac. I'll come back to that later. That is forbidden. Observer of times. Or an enchanter. One who chants. How often have we uh, heard people say to a woman, a man to a woman, woman, well, nowadays, woman to woman, uh, oh, you look enchanting tonight. Is that a good thing? What does it mean to, to be enchanted? An enchanted forest, haunted house. What is an enchantment? 
When you begin to chant a mantra or a witch's chant over an object, over a place, in order to invoke evil spirits to come into that place and dwell there. Any kind of chanting. Witches always chant. They'll get together and they'll have these witches chants like, Queen of Heaven, Queen of Hell, send your aid to the spell. Queen of Heaven, Queen of Hell, send your aid to the spell. And they'll chant it. I'm not chanting it right now, I'm just saying it. But they would, they would chant it and it would get deeper and deeper and more rhythmic and rhythmic. And pretty soon they go into an altered state of consciousness and this evil spirit would come in and that's what makes the spell work. Or you could go into a Catholic church and you're chanting, right? The old Latin, remember the old Gregorian chants? Et filio filiae, rex tre lystus, rex gloriae, et filiae hodie. Ah. And they go into their hallelujahs, hallelujahs, and, and uh, that's chanting, that's witchcraft. When they chant it over and over and over, and that's one of their more cheerful ones. Some of them are, are very, very grave, as if they were just brought up from one. But anyway, uh, any kind of chanting. You have mantras in, in the Hindu religion. Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, and then over and over, Om, 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 Om. And before long, they're in an altered state of consciousness. Enchantment, to chant over something to chant over a people, get them to chant so that the spirits come in. All of this chanting leads to enchantment and that is what God absolutely forbids. All right? So then it mentions a consulter, or pardon me, a witch. We don't want to leave that out. Witchcraft is a religion that worships and honors the force of nature or forces of nature and primarily they believe there's a good side of the force and a bad side of the force. Did you ever hear that before? Did you ever hear Darth Vader? Luke Skywalker? How about this Star Wars? If you went to Star Wars and saw that you'd been to church, a satanic church, a witchcraft church. Now I understand Witches don't believe in Satan. The devil won't let them believe in him, or their witchcraft won't work. The devil's working in it, but he does it secretly. They think they're worshiping nature. These unseen forces that they can harness through a ritual, through an enchantment, through a spell, through whatever ritual they're doing. But there are these two forces, one good, one evil, and what you do is you always harness it for the good of yourself. So good triumphs over evil. Remember the Wizard of Oz? The good witch of the North and South. The bad witch of the East and the West. And by the way, uh, if you ever wondered why Hillary is so fiery and so forceful like a little Hitler, except for she's missing the little schnurbart, they might as well paint one on there. If you're wondering why she is so militant and she gets up there and really lets you out. It's because it's all that pent up anger ever since that house fell on her sister. Anyway, now God absolutely forbids all of these things. A uh, charmer is one who will take an object and put a spell on that object and then it has power. You are charmed. You have, come to think of it, wasn't there a TV program like that? Charmed. Then you have invoked power from the astral plane to come into your life. All right? Now, how many people watch that and they, it makes them think like a witch? They start thinking. They're moved by it. They react to it emotionally that there is a higher force. Do you know how many people believe in reincarnation now that didn't before? All these witchcraft principles through Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, they're getting doctrine, 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 doctrine. 
People say it isn't real witchcraft because good triumphs over evil. Good triumphing over evil is real witchcraft. That's what witches teach, that there's good witchcraft that's better than bad witchcraft and stronger than bad witchcraft. So the heroes are good witches. And God forbids all witchcraft, 100% of it. Okay? Now, a charmer is one who attaches magic, through magic, attaches power to a charm, a charm bracelet, or any other artifact or device, image, whatever. Okay? A consulter with familiar spirits. That is when you, by whatever means, contact a spirit directly. Talk to that spirit. Have an interaction with that spirit. Now, the other one, the other two, I should say, are wizard and necromancer. A wizard is simply a male witch. You see, it's not a warlock. The word warlock is a Scotch Gaelic word that means a traitor, somebody that comes out of witchcraft. But they want you to think that a warlock is a male witch because they think all Christians are stupid because they don't even know who the gods are and goddesses. They look at Christians as being idiots because they stole all the witches' holidays and renamed them, that everything the Christians have was stolen from witches. And they're right as far as organized so-called Christianity, Catholicism, and her daughters. Yes, they did, in fact, steal those holidays from the witches. All right? Witches were doing Easter and Christmas or Baal Mass and these other things a long time before Jesus was even born. And we'll get into that also in a little bit. A wizard is a male witch, not a warlock, but a wizard. A necromancer is one who contacts dead people, which isn't possible. If you made contact with a dead person, you didn't. You made contact with a spirit impersonating that dead person. In a seance or whatever, because you cannot contact a person who has gone on. All right? And so the Lord forbids all of these things. They're an abomination unto the Lord. And that's why God drove the heathen out. Now, what's going to happen with our nation when we embrace these things? Has God changed his mind? Does he wink at it? Does he look the other way and make believe he just doesn't see? Or are the eyes of the Lord throughout all the earth beholding the good and the evil? Let's move forward. We have made a covenant with death and with hell are we at agreement. Wow, what a verse, Isaiah 28, 15. How true it is in our day. And you look at, at this, there's the grim reaper, there's a child dressed up like a ghost, uh, pumpkin or jack-o'-lantern, and so forth. By the way, the jack-o'-lantern itself is a symbol that you have cooperated with Satan and that you have consented to human sacrifice. That's the meaning of a carved-out pumpkin with a light in it. The old Druids used to take pumpkins on their walk towards Stonehenge and they would carve it out and they would have a candle made from tallow, human tallow, and they would burn that inside of that jack-o'-lantern. And they put that at the gate of a city or at a door where people gave up a member of that village or city for human sacrifice. That's what the, the thing means. It's no joke. And uh, God is absolutely uh, against it. It is detestable. It is abomination. And how many people say, well, I don't mean anything by it. It's just, it's just something I do. Everything we do, we must give an account for. Every idle word we speak, we give an account for. It all has to be within the context and framework of what is pleasing to God, and this most certainly is not, all right? Halloween is a satanic holiday. It is a witch's Sabbath. It is full of the devil. There is nothing good in it. It shouldn't be that hard to understand. But people have made an agreement with hell, a covenant with death. 
They want the dark, the macabre, the mysterious, the weird. It sends chills up and down their spine. You know, witches have one thing in common. They all love to be scared to death all the time. There are witches who have been known to have their hair turn white overnight from interacting with spirits. They wake up in the morning, they had color in their hair, but it's all gone the next day because they had a supernatural experience overnight. And it always involves that thrill, that it, it gets the adrenaline going. They get a high from that. Probably for the same reason people get on roller coasters and up and down. Who in the world? You know, when I was a kid, yeah. You wouldn't get me on one now. You know, why pay good money for a lunch and then lose it there? Anyway, so this is the attitude of people. They, they literally, whether they know it or not, if they participate in these things, they've made an agreement with hell. They've adopted the principles of darkness. Now, this is what most people uh, look at a witch as looking like, a, a caricature like this. Here you see this witch with a pointed nose, with a wart, a pointed hat, uh, got a figure like a sack of doorknobs, you know. These, uh, that's the way these, these witches are supposed to look, you know. Little pointed, big pointed shoes, I should say, and a cauldron. Now that cauldron is really used. They're not generally that big, but the cauldrons are much smaller than that. And what the cauldron is is the womb of Mother Earth. And that's why they drop all of these things here. You see this witch pouring blood out of a, a Florence flask into the boiling cauldron. And here, this uh, Erlenmeyer flask is full of eyeballs, you know, eye of Newt, Gingrich, <laughs> um, eye of Newt, you know, all that sort of thing. This is just a cartoon character, full moon at her back, stars all around, five-pointed, and uh, the fire under the cauldron. But that isn't what witches really look like, necessarily. This uh, is what witches look like. This is the Salem, Massachusetts Coven. Now, I've been to Salem. Sister Pat, you've been to Salem. Uh, my wife has been there. Salem is really quite a place. It's very witchy. In fact, at Halloween, time, which is about, a, they have about a 10-day celebration. They even have a witch train that runs from Boston up to Salem. It's loaded with witches. They have approximately 50,000 witches in Salem. It's not a big city either. And of course, uh, Lori Cabot, the high priestess of Salem right here. This is her daughter, Jody, who is now growing up and owns an occult store there. I saw her once, went into her store, went in to rebuke it. Now the person, I was looking for directions to try and find Collins Cove, actually, when I went in there. And the woman who waited on me was a vampire. She had been to the dentist. He put in permanent stainless steel fangs that hung out over her lower lip. She was a blood drinker. All right? Uh, these people are real. I've met them. I've interacted with them. I've rebuked them in Jesus' name. I've done battle with them, and I can tell you they are real. Of course, at one time, I was very much part of that world as an astrologer and was into other types of fortune-telling as well. Now, the Lord saved me out of that, thank God. At that time, I never would have believed I'd be preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus and condemning this, because this was my world, and, and the Lord did wonders. He is mighty to save, folks. And if you're watching this anywhere in this world, I can tell you the Lord is able to save you out of this. If you will repent and give it all over to God, he will help you. Amen. He did it for me. He'll do it for you. Now, this is the coven at Salem. Lori Cabot also teaches witchcraft and ceremonial magic at Salem College. She was also declared the official witch of Salem by then Governor Dukakis. Can you imagine the state of Massachusetts, the People's Republic of Massachusetts, as I call it? They're about as communist as China is. Can you imagine state charter, 
chartering a witch as an official witch of Salem. Well, he did it. And it shouldn't surprise us too much because our whole governor runs, government rather, runs on witchcraft. There are many, many covens throughout the United States, and these covens are the power behind the government. And they're paid. There are witches on staff. Uh, represent, pardon me, uh, Senator Claiborne Pell. I believe he was of Rhode Island, little state of Rhode Island. But he was out in New England anyway, and he was a senator from there. And all the while he was a senator, he had a paid witch on staff. He called her a psychic. She was on government payroll. That was her job, government psychic. Now, should that surprise us? Because didn't Nebuchadnezzar have soothsayers? Bel Belshazzar, rather, didn't he have them? Uh, how about... Uh, Artaxerxes and, and all these others. Pharaoh had them, right? They all had them. Our government has them. Because this is the power behind what they're doing. To try to bring forth a ruler, an antichrist, to take complete control of the whole world and direct people to worship Satan through an image made to the beast. Now, it's all working up to that. One thing you'll notice here, and this picture came out of National Geographic magazine, the tr source of all truth and wisdom. But this, uh, they always feature things like that. But anyway, this came out of National Geographic, and you can't see it real well here, but in color, and I don't have the color picture, I, I'm still trying to find it, but there is a network, a very forked, uh, it's blue actually, I don't know if you can see it a little bit there. All those little jagged forks. That is a force field surrounding their circle. And what you're seeing there is the manifestation of a principality, a, a demonic principality called Rija. Rija sometimes appears as blue lightning or as a blue snake with red eyes. Now if you look at Gene Dixon's book, a gift of prophecy which is available at the library it will tell you that when she was receiving her gift of prophecy she was laying in bed suddenly she felt a sensation come over her caused her to sit up in her bed and then she looked to the east now she'll have this right in the front of her book as she looked east a serpent a wispy serpent coiled itself around her and then looked into her eyes and then she felt the gift of prophecy descend upon her. Now you know that was not the anointing of God. And she's the one who predicted Kennedy's death in Dallas and so forth and a lot of other things. The problem is she was wrong on several occasions about things. And if you're wrong once, you're not of God. You've got to be 100%. All right? And God makes sure that these witches are always wrong at least some of the time no matter how much the devil helps them. You know, I was preaching one time in New York City on 23rd Street, live television, and I taught from Matthew 24. The whole tri-state area was being covered. And I didn't know it at the time, but right next door to me, there was a room full of witches doing their 900 numbers, people calling in, and, and they were doing their divination, and I had them all messed up. And the producer came, and he was so mad that I was there. He never wanted me back there again. See, there was some power. We're blocking their signal. The preaching of the gospel, the anointed preaching, was blocking out their ability to tell fortunes. And it was really messing them up. Praise the Lord. I think that's wonderful. Okay? So anyway, this lightning here is actually a blue, uh, well, it's a very jagged stream moving across the front of them. And Lori Cabot, right here, the high priestess of the coven, said that is the manifestation of our spirit. The force. All right? How does one think like a witch? Remember I said witchcraft is first and foremost a way of thinking? The way you think like a witch, first of all, is you've got to start thinking that 
there are two equal and opposing forces. They talk about good and evil. We're the good guys, the uh, Iraqis are the bad guys. Right? There's always the good guy, the bad guy. Uh, any Western on television, although it's all detective stories now, but when I was a kid they had Westerns all the time. You always got to have some dirty rat pulling some terrible thing, and then Matt Dillon's going to come along and get him, right? Or Wyatt Earp or somebody. That good is going to triumph over evil. You show the real bad, and then you show the good, and the good wins, and everybody's happy. Well, in witchcraft, they show the good witches overcoming Harry Potter, remember? In the Lord of the Rings, you have the same sort of a thing. The lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. All witchy, but good triumphing. It's still all witchcraft. And that's what we have to realize. How does one think like a witch? You have to think in terms of dualism. Now here is uh, Tai Chi. Some of you have heard of that. Th whoops, I've got to go back one here. There we go. This is the yin-yang symbol. Black with a white dot, white with a black dot. Now notice these marks as you go clockwise around the center. First, you're totally blocked from entry. Three lines, solid lines blocking you. Here the outer one is open. You can only go in so far. After you go through that ritual of meditation, you're in there. Now the next one opens up for you. Then you're in there. Now both are open. Here it's all the way open so you can go in to the power source. Now when you're in, you try to get out. You can't. You get that far. Then this blocks the way. Then a double block and then a triple block and you can't get out at all. So you're in for good. All right? Remember that song, Hotel California? We're programmed to receive. You can check out any time you'd like, but you can never leave. Okay? Dualism, that there are two equal gods. Equal power that have to be brought into balance. That's the principle of Tai Chi. Now, notice something. And any of the, by the way, do you know who developed this symbol and put it on the South Korean flag? Our own general, Douglas MacArthur, who was an occultist. He thought he was the reincarnation of Genghis Khan. And of course, so did uh, uh, Patton, George Patton. He'd walk along on a battlefield and say, God, I hate the 20th century. Remember? He said, I was here before. Whether it be the Battle of Actium or Thermopylae or any of these ancient battles, all reincarnated. See, he came back again, always as a soldier. Okay? So this, oh, by the way, notice where this came from. Union Theological Seminary at Broadway and 121st Street in New York City. I've been in there. When I was in there, they were just getting ready to have a gay wedding. A couple of ministers going to get married to the same sex, you know. This was at one time a Methodist seminary. Now it's open to train any ministers. And if you graduate from Union Theological, you've got a job. These are the cream of the crop right here, these guys and girls, whatever. So this is, and of course in their spare time, they do this stuff, you know. Spirituality, right? Teach them how to think like a witch. Dualism, you see? I don't believe in dualism. I believe there's one God. People say, well, there's hot and cold. There's light and dark. People go and take karate. And they stand there before they start their maneuvers. And they go like this. Then they go like this and like this and like this and like that and make the little circles, which is three sixes. See the middle here and the three tails, six, six, six. And they stand there like that and they do their little chanting, cross their legs and all this kind of stuff. But that principle of dualism is wrong. Okay, take for an example heat. There's heat, there isn't hot and cold. There is not hot and cold. There's heat, there's less heat. There's little heat, there's no heat. Cold is the absence of heat. Damnation is the absence of God. When God throws people into hell, and he will. 
The Bible says so. Okay? Then, that's the absence of damnation, is to be damned, cut off from God. All right? Uh, we can deal with the same thing with light. There's much light, less light, little light, no light. Darkness is the absence of light. It isn't another entity. There's one God. That principle of dualism is taught to us, but it's not right. And if you believe that, you're thinking like a witch. Okay? You either have it or you don't. Okay, now, this was taken in Madison, Wisconsin. This is a Pink Floyd concert. We can see how they think. Now that, wonder, wonder what it costs to put that up, huh? They have got a major production there. All those people are sitting under the large yin and yang symbol, being invested with the spirit of the event. That's the problem with a rock concert. You go there and you come home with devils. They follow you home. Sometimes they come on the inside and you carry them home. But you never go away unscathed. If you go there to be entertained by that sort of thing, they have done a number on you. And you are thinking like a witch when you've been to one of those. All right? Only God can take that out of your heart and out of your mind. How does a witch pray? What are spells? Why do witches use candles? Why do witches chant? I explained the chanting a little while ago. Uh, but how does a witch pray? Well, when a witch is casting a spell, they're praying. They do it through a psychic prayer. They do it through channeling. When they do a spell, they are casting a spell. That's like even in meteorology, I don't like the word forecast. You're throwing something at somebody. Forecasting is witchcraft terminology. So what are spells? Well, by what you say and what you do with certain objects to make certain things happen. And they use things like rope, for an example, a chalice. A killing knife, even if they don't kill anything, they insert the knife into the chalice and bring about the unity of the two forces, male and female, and so forth. But that is how they project what they desire to happen. The uh, use of candles is quite heavy. They use it a lot because candles are cheap, and they come in different colors. They can do it in the privacy of their bedroom or living room or wherever. They light the candle, they gaze into the flame until they, they keep it's a form of hypnosis. They go into an altered state of consciousness. Pretty soon they start saying things and start feeling things as the spirit takes over. Now, real witches generally use beeswax only. Go into a Catholic church, a Lutheran church, wherever, they will specify it must be beeswax. Unless they've gotten real cheap lately, but traditionally, it's always been beeswax because the bee was alive. It came from something organic, whereas paraffin came as a product of fractional distillation of petroleum. And witches believe that in everything there is a spirit, but things that were once alive or are alive, that there is a spirit of the gods and goddesses in them. Smithsonian Magazine, the prestigious Smithsonian, did a feature on pendulum magic. Pendulum magic is when you take a, a chain or a string or whatever and attach a weighted object at the bottom, and there are all different kinds of these, and you hold it over something and ask it questions. It's like a Ouija board on a string. You ask it questions, and the pendulum will move back and forth or in a circular manner, however you want to do it, and it'll answer your questions of yes or no, or you can lay it on top of things, and, and it'll move certain ways and indicate different uh, answers for you. Now, my own sister one time, when she was pregnant, another one of my sisters has always been a spooky you know, affinity toward witchy things. She would 
she immediately took a pendulum and said, let's find out if it's going to be a boy or a girl. So she put out her left wrist for life force, held it above her wrist, and it went back and forth and in a circle, showing boy and girl. And then it kind of settled down, so she had to guess. The child turned out to be a lesbian. Do you know how many lesbians and queers and homos are out there because people have used witchcraft somewhere along the line and they were born with a curse? The Lord said to the third and fourth generations of them that hate me, didn't he say it? Exodus chapter 20. And so if you do that sort of a thing, you're cursed, your child's cursed, your grandchildren are cursed, your great-grandchildren are cursed because of that. Now, God can save you, yes. But left to yourself and by your own devices and doing these things of Satan, you are bringing the power of evil spirits into the realm of your life. Okay? Pendulum magic. I'm going to just get through this section, then we're going to take a break for a few minutes and then come back. Okay? It goes fast, doesn't it? All right, now... In the same Smithsonian Magazine, here we have, it says, Urban New Agers, whoops, pardon me, have taken over the art of dowsing. Now here it shows pen, a pendulum. This woman is in a video store, and she's laid out a whole bunch of videos, and she's got a pendulum over each one to see which one would be the best for her to watch. You know, have we all become members of a fruitcake academy in this country? No, it, she's very taking this very seriously. Which video should I get? Which shoes should I buy? You know, when a choice is to be made, whatever it is, the pendulum, you get the pendulum out and hold it over there and see what it does. Now, here you see these people water witching. Now, this young woman is using the rod method. This isn't a divining rod. These look like chopsticks, and they're actually held very, in a very similar manner with clenched fist in this case, life force on the left, life, pro life progress on the right. Here you'll notice in the traditional way of doing it with a divining rod, the palms are up, the thumbs are making the little circle, and you're trying to harness the power from the astral plane to come down into your hands, connect with Mother Earth, so Mother Earth will show you where the water is. And they will tell you that it works. Here we have the city engineer from Fayetteville, Arkansas. And he's got his pendulum out there. Because what he's doing is wielding his pendulum over the plan of Fayetteville to determine the flow of underground water. Hmm. High tech? Pendulum magic. In government? Oh, especially. Okay, we're going to, I'm going to do this slide and then we're going to take our break. This is actually a slide showing a picture of witchcraft Barbie. Now, I've never thought Barbie dolls were any good because the devil's in all of them. But here you've got one that Mattel came out with and it is a witch. And she has a little cauldron here. And this Barbie kit comes complete with a cauldron, with a book on how to cast spells, and with magical powders to throw into the cauldron. I don't know if she's trying to get a date with Ken or, or what the deal is there. But anyway, it's all designed to get children to think like witches. That's Mattel's Witchcraft Barbie. Okay. We'll take a brief break right here, uh, so why don't we do that if we want to put the equipment on pause. All right, praise the Lord. We're back from our break. We're going to continue on. Of course, where we left off was I was telling you about the Mattel Witch Barbie, something we definitely don't need in a toy box, but uh, uh, it is out there along with a lot of other such evil things. In fact, Witchcraft toys are very, very popular ever since the Harry Potter books have come out and the movies. People have an affinity for this sort of a thing. Now, that's because there's a spirit in it. 
This is not just fun and games. We're talking about, remember the agreement with hell, the covenant with death, all right? Even Walt Disney has gotten into the act. This is an online uh, place you can go to. And here are five witches. Notice they're all dressed quite differently, all female. You've got uh, Will, Irma, Tyranny, uh, Cornelia, and Bailey. Bailey, pardon me, Bailey. And this is, uh, take the first letter of each name, spells witch. And you can go on into this uh, oh, wow. website, story, cool stuff, meet the girls, and it spells witch here. This is Disney Online. And these are all ruined signs. The ruined signs are from, well, there's several types of runes. There's Celtic runes, there's Norse runes, there's Teutonic runes. They're, they are uh, designs like letters of an alphabet and they spell things or indicate certain words. What's interesting is the one way on the left, because this is that sign curve, it's that S curve, like this, like you see on a Pepsi Cola can. Or Coca-Cola uses it the other way, they got that wave, you know? So, uh, Disney, very much involved in witchcraft. It's not a family-oriented thing at all. They've, gone from bad to worse. In fact, the very first pornographic movies that were made in this country were made at Disney Studios. Disney didn't make them, but they rented the studios out to the pornographers. That's one of the ways that Walt Disney made his money. All right, now, spells of magic. We talked about spells earlier, and uh, this gives information on how spells work and why they work. I'm not going to read all of this, but briefly, it'll tell you that you have to, if you're going to cast a spell, that you have to do it by moon phase. The proper moon phase is one of the keys to success in spell casting. Just as a farmer may plant his seeds, or how fish spawn on a full moon, during the full moon, a full moon can help you with your spells. But some spells work better on other phases of the moon. So, it gets real complicated in there, depending on what you want to do. There are four phases in the moon, each one lasts seven days. You have a 28-day cycle. That's why they say the moon is female, because a female is on a 28-day ovulating cycle. And so they believe when the moon becomes full, it's an ovulating moon. That every time there's a full moon, it sends an egg down to Mother Earth. It's then fertilized by the sun god the next morning as the rays of the sun hit it and new spirits are born, or spiritual activity is born. So the sun is always male, the moon is always female. And then it goes on to explain proper materials and supplies. Of course, here it tells about the phases of new moon, waxing moon, full moon, waning moon. We don't need to know all the details on that, but spells are cast by moonlight. Then you have to use the correct ingredients. In other words, it says don't use a green candle in a love spell. Use a red one. Why? Because red is the color of lust. And it isn't love they're dealing with, it's lust. All right? There are no love spells. There are lust spells. Because it's witchcraft. And then, of course, uh, it goes on to explain the mental condition of the practitioner when King and all you find all of this in the Harry Potter movies, by the way, and books, in one way or another. When casting a spell, you must be focused on the spell, the target, and the emotions of the spell. When casting a love spell, you must have love in your heart. I describe that as hatred as, as rather a, a lust. This is not hatred. Likewise, when casting a hex, you must have hatred for the person you are casting a spell on. In other words, your emotions have to match the spell. Now, no wonder Jesus condemned hatred. If you hate your brother, what happens? Yeah, you're in danger, right? If you say, Rega, worthless spell. 
if you uh, call a person a fool, you can't call a brother or sister a fool. You know why? Because anybody who's got enough sense to give their heart to Jesus Christ is no fool. No matter what else has happened in their life, they're no fool if they've submitted to the Lord. Okay? By heaven's definition. But here to cast a spell, you have to have that feeling of the spell. Now notice it mentions a spell of, of called a hex. The symbol of a hex is a six-pointed star. Hex is six. The hexagram, six-sided figure, six-sided star. That's where you, that's the most powerful symbol in witchcraft. That's where you get the word hex from, this hexagram. Another thing they use in other terminology is imprecatory. Imprecatory means to curse. Somebody says pray an imprecatory prayer. That's a witch's psychic prayer. It means to curse. And there are people who will do that. All right? Now, there are uh, other factors here. The experience of the practitioner it says if you only cast a spell once in a while, that's not enough. Cast a lot of them. Because then you're picking up experience and you, you're gaining in power for magic. You can do more and more and more of your spells will come to pass. At first they might not, but you get better at it. Better at it. You know why? You're picking up new evil spirits every time you do it. And before long you are a cauldron or you are a chalice, a human chalice, filling up with demon spirits. And it's no joke. It really happens. The magical energy built up by the practitioner. So there you're building up power with each one. Your belief in the magic you are working, so you have to really believe in what you're doing. In other words, as your faith is, so be it unto you. Is that a mockery? Yeah, what the Lord told us. We have faith in Jesus Christ. And that faith is powerful. And God works miracles through it. In witchcraft, they teach the same thing. But from the standpoint of evil. Satan is a counterfeit. Alright? The will of the universe. I like this. No matter how good your ingredients are, how much power you have, you cannot change the will of the universe. You know what that means? They cannot go against the will of God. But they call it the will of the universe. The universe doesn't have a will. The one who created the universe has a will. And they can't go against it. It doesn't work. And so they put that caveat in there that you can't do that. The right spell. And obviously if the spell doesn't work, you must have had either the wrong spell, the wrong ingredients, the wrong mood, something that doesn't work. Keep notes, try it over, and so forth, and adjust as you can to get them to work. Casting of spells. Every witch gets into that. But understand, if you think like a witch, how do I know if I'm a witch? If I wish evil on people. If I'm mad at somebody, you say, oh, I hope they die again. Oh, I want that to stay. I want that to happen. Or, let's say your child is climbing a tree, and you yell out the window, you're going to fall out of that tree. You just put one on them. You don't do it that way. Say, I don't want you to fall. Come down. But you don't say, you're going to fall. You're going to bump your head. You're going to this and that. You're putting one on them. Come on. Now, God is still merciful and gracious. I know that. But you, we can't be thinking that way or talking that way. And if you're going to spank your children, never do it when you're angry. Or do it out of anger. That's not the proper way. Okay? Simmer down. Reason it out. And then if I need a little corporal punishment, fine. But uh, never act out of hatred. Never be imprecatory. Never a hex. Never a curse. Now you can pray against evil. That's fine. We should. Lord, close that place down. Let it be destroyed. We're not trying to destroy human life, but there are some places that, that where you, you ask God, Lord, take it out of the way. There's nothing wrong with that. That's fine. Abortion clinics, uh, places of blasphemy, ill repute, all that. 
That's fine. We've seen places close up after prayer. That's a good thing. But that you're not out to hurt anybody. Those places are destroying families, destroying lives. So we ask God to take them out of the way. Or places of blasphemy. That's a whole different thing. That's not done out of hatred. That actually is done because you love the ways of God and you hate the ways of evil. There's a big, big difference. We're not acting out of hatred at all. If you pray for God to close a business up or take it down or out of there and, and leave it up to him and see what he'll do with it. I'll give you an example of that in a few minutes. Here you see the Olympics. So everybody loves the Olympics, right? Not me. It is one of the most occult, blasphemous things that ever came along. And you'll notice the Summer Olympics comes every four years, always on leap year. Always on the year of the presidential election. Because the presidential election is run on spirit power. This is what's known as a triad. You've got the torch itself. You've got the ignition here. This, now this is lighted by the rays of the sun. And here you see this man igniting the torch. It's done by a magnifying glass from the rays of the sun. And then the other element of the triad is the olive leaf branch, forming a triumphal power. This torch is then taken all around the world at the cost of literally millions of dollars. It's taken on airplanes. When's the last time I let you bring a flaming torch on an airplane? But they'll do it for this. They charter a special plane, a 747. Do you know how much it costs to fly a 747? Did you know on one wing of a 747 there's enough fuel to fill, fill an Olympic-sized swimming pool? They're flying this torch all around the world. They carry it up the streets, through New York, all through the states. In fact, Dr. James Dobson, the so-called Christian psychologist, carried the torch one year. It was a couple of years ago. This is an occult event. This is lighted on Mount Olympus, the Mount of the Gods, by the rays of the sun in the presence of a priestess. But Dobson had no trouble carrying it. That was his civic duty, wasn't it? He was proud to do it. Made him feel athletic. He's up there with his jogging pants on carrying the torch. All right? Uh, by the way, with that Olympic uh, thing, the five rings, interlocking rings, represent earth, wind, water, fire, and spirit. They also take that torch and they light a cauldron with it, remember, at the games? They invoke the powers of the gods and goddesses. It isn't just a bunch of athletic competition. It is a religious event providing plenty of spirit power for the coming election in the United States and the other Antichrist events as well. That's why they do it. All right? What does a witch hold sacred? Well, here's a witchcraft altar. And by the way, with the exception of the ceremonial killing knife, called an atame. Now it's spelled, it looks like athame. A-T-H-A-M-E, but it's pronounced atame. With the exception of that black-handled killing knife, everything else on the witchcraft altar is found on a Roman Catholic altar. The salt, the water, the little bell. Of course, uh, mm -hmm. this is actually a spell tied with scarlet ribbon. We have beeswax candles and so forth, but it's all there. There are a few rune stones, sacred objects. Of course, in the Catholic system, they bent those sacred objects right into the altar so you can't see them. They'll have a piece of a bone from St. Peter or something in there, you know. Uh, splinter from the cross, or whatever. But anyway, witches hold all these things sacred. They've got the chalice, which is the female element. The knife is the male element. They insert the knife into the chalice, and they draw down the power of the moon. I had a strong rebuke one time from a, a, the wife of an Episcopal priest in England because I called it like it was. I saw an article in the, the uh, Daily Telegraph regarding this priest, 
and how he and his wife do witchcraft ritual, Wiccan rituals, right in the Episcopal Church. And I told her what an abomination it was to call that Christianity. And she wrote back to me, and oh, she was all flustered. What's wrong with that? We're good Christians. We can mix witchcraft with Christianity. Witchcraft is a good thing. But of course, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, was made a druid wearing the white robe, the laurel wreath, and he was invested with the spirits of the sun god. I've got a picture of that. And so they have no problem with witchcraft at all. All right? So, yes, they hold all kinds of, these things are all sacred to them. This is the pentacle, the five-pointed star. Notice it's interlocked, intertwined, you see? The elements of air and water are above, and earth and fire are below, and then spirit points straight up. The prince of the power of the air. This is the pentacle. Now, if you turn the two points up, so kind of tilt your heads a little bit. You have the horned hunter of the night in the very face of Satan. The goat of Mendez or Baphomet. The eastern star in masonry uses this. It's on our flag, 50 of them, in a blue field. If you went into a Masonic lodge, they'll have a blue ceiling with white stars on there, 50 white stars on that ceiling, if it's up to date. In Nebuchadnezzar's temple, and later on Belshazzar's temple, where the handwriting was on the wall, there was a blue ceiling with the 50 stars. Why? Because all of that is operated by the same evil spirits. The pentacle is also our Congressional Medal of Honor along with a few ribbons and decorations. But, you know, you teach children, they, you go to church, you know, and they have Sunday school classes, the children know their memory verse, you give them a star. Right? Symbol of witchcraft. And that's all it is. How can I tell if I'm a witch? Do you have an affinity for these things? Okay, in the bale mass season, Christmas as it's called, they put up the tree, the bale bush, they decorate it with bulbs, they also bulbs. Right? Put a star on the top, right? Or a two-winged angel. When you read the Bible, there are no two-winged angels. They either have four or six. But there are no two-winged angels anywhere in the Bible. And they always got them dressed up like a woman and with long flowing blonde hair. They look like they stepped off a magazine cover. Alright? Those are not what angels look like. If you saw an angel, you would do what they did in the Bible, fall on your face and quake with fear. They excel in strength. All right, now, this is what witches hold sacred, such things as this, but this is their symbol of COVID power. Some people have asked me about Procter & Gamble, who, by the way, they pulled their symbol now, but it used to be a crescent moon with 13 stars which is a symbol of a COVID. Now, I don't know if they knew it or not. I can't prove that. But I can tell you the symbol itself intrinsically is evil and indicates a COVID. But I can't say that the company is satanic and all that. If you wanted my opinion, I think they were and are. But I can't prove that. That's my opinion. All right? I'm not just trying to stay out of trouble. That's just the way it is. But I can tell you the symbol they use, or have used, rather, is evil in and of itself. Okay? Gargoyles. This was taken in the basement of our National Cathedral. Incidentally, our National Cathedral, this is what it looks like basically. Notice the bat's heads there, the wings that rise way up, and the little head there, the top of the cathedral itself. This is just a little miniature of it. And they have all these gargoyles on the side of the building. Let's move ahead. You can actually buy these and take them home and for sale. But these are demon spirits, caricatures, images of evil spirits. Notice the grotesque faces, the ugliness that's here. And uh, really, and use some more of those uh, bats' hands. 
That's the prevailed way into the architecture. But they have them all over the building. And this is where they hold the funerals for the presidents and the important people as National Cathedral. Now, what's interesting about that is the way the cathedral is laid out. They hold these, these special services there, these funerals, these get-togethers to honor these men. And the power of Satan is so strong in there because all around the whole building, you've got gargoyles. And when I was there, they had a brand new one put up. They were bragging. They had a handout sheet with a picture of it. It was none other than Darth Vader, the dark side of the force. And they put it in our National Cathedral, way at the top by the front entrance, in a prominent place. Our government isn't bad as you thought, it's worse. I don't know if you heard about it, but in the state of Wisconsin, they're wrestling with the budget right now. And one of the items up for consideration is a tax on filing taxes. Now they're going to tax the tax. Okay? The filing of it. Anyway, if you're, going to, if you're going to file your tax, you're going to pay a tax on filing the tax. Or you can do the Roman Catholic thing. This is witchcraft. The lighting of candles in front of an image. There's, this was taken at the National uh, Roman Catholic Center in uh, Washington, D.C. You can see all the candles there lighted to mark the death of a, of a loved one. Marks that point on the zodiac, you see. The wreaths, of course, a lot of those happen in December, don't they? They use evergreens in that case, but it's just because it's that time of the year. But notice something here. Of course, this was taken in Salem, Massachusetts in a witchcraft store. You can buy a a wreath that says Merry Meet, this one says Blessed Be, which is a witch's greeting, both of those are. But they love wreaths because they believe that it creates a parameter keeping evil forces out and the good forces of good in. You can find them to the inside of the circle. And always the ribbons forming a pentacle. They hold those as sacred. All wreaths are sacred to a witch. What does a witch believe about the afterlife? They believe in reincarnation, triads, fairies, and witchcraft and wicca all work together. Reincarnation, that when you die, you come back as something else. Maybe a human, maybe a dog, a cat, a snake, a cow, whatever. Come back as something. Now, if you've been a bad little boy or a bad little girl, you might have to wait a long time where you're sent off to a place called Dark Star. It's a planet out there somewhere where there's nothing but darkness and the night winds called Mariah blow upon it and you have to wait to be born into a body. So this is what they believe, that you will come back. You just, they believe in recycling. You know, all this talk about recycling metal, recycling. It's all part of the witchcraft religion. Now, I have no, no problem with making use of scrap metal and scrap this and scrap that, but they make a religion out of it. Nowadays, you have to gift wrap your garbage. They hold even garbage sacred. No, recycling is all part of the reincarnation thought process. You reuse it. You come back. You go around the circle again. Okay? So they believe in life after death in the form of another life. You come back and get a new body. Triads are, that means a power of three. And of course, uh, any time you have three people praying the same psychic prayer, see, that's another mockery, isn't it? Wherever two or three are gathered together in my name, if any two or three of you agree on any one thing, see, then it'll be done for you but it has to be the will of God. Now, witches mock everything because Satan is a counterfeiter. All right? How do witches celebrate birth? This came right out of Childcraft Encyclopedia, Volume 9, 1986 edition. Your very own holiday. You have a holiday that is your very own, your birthday. The day you were born is a very special day for you and your family. 
You probably celebrate this holiday with a birthday cake, perhaps with a party, and by getting presents. For thousands of years, people all over the world have thought of a birthday as a very special day. Long ago, people believed that on a birthday, a person could be helped by good spirits or hurt by evil spirits. So, when a person had a birthday, friends and relatives gathered to protect him or her. They had a party. That's how birthday parties began. The idea of putting candles on birthday cakes goes back to ancient Greece. The Greeks worshipped many gods and goddesses. Among them was one called Artemis. Artemis was the goddess of the moon. The Greeks celebrated her birthday once each month by bringing special cakes to her temple. The cakes were round like a full moon, and because the moon glows with light, the cakes were decorated with lighted candles. Not everyone celebrates their birthday. Some people celebrate their name day instead. In certain religions, children are named for a saint. Each saint is honored on a special day called the Saint's Feast Day. People who are named for a saint often celebrate the Saint's Feast Day, their name day, rather than their own birthday. At the front of each of the following sections of the book, then it tells about what your name day is or when that is. Now, this came right from the Coven of the Enchanted Circle. And it says this. This is right from the witch's mouth here, this, this article. One of the simplest of magical arts, which comes under the heading of natural magic, is candle burning. It is simple because it employs little ritual and few ceremonial artifacts. The theatrical props of candle magic can be purchased at any department store, and its rituals can be practiced in any sitting room or bedroom. Most of us have performed our first act of candle magic by the time we were two years old. Blowing out the tiny candles on our first birthday cake and making a wish is pure magic. The childhood custom is based on the three magical principles of concentration, willpower, and visualization. In simple terms, the child who wants his wish to come true has to concentrate, blow out the candles, visualize the end result, make a wish, and hope that it will come true, or willpower. All right? I think enough said there, and that's what they teach the little children to do. Make a wish, close your eyes, blow out the candle. They're practicing witchcraft. Notice this says by the time you're two, why not one? Witches believe that you're born basically when you're conceived. And then when you actually come forth from the womb, then you mark that spot on the zodiac. What is the witchcraft calendar? This is Selena Fox of Circle Sanctuary in Barneveld, not too far from Madison. Her husband, Dennis Carpenter, who was the who was an associate professor of anthropology at uh, Berkeley University. The two of them were hand fast that are married under Wiccan ritual, and they run Circle Sanctuary. She wrote, there they, they're there standing in their sacred, or at the edge of their sacred circle. She wrote an article called, I Am Pagan. Now in this article, she tells about the, the eight, rather, the eight Sabbaths, Samhain, which is Halloween, and then in February you have, or pardon me, then there's Yule in December, Christmas as it's called. Notice how she says she celebrates Yule. She says she celebrates the great goddess and, and all those aspects and the father god as Santa in his old sky god father time, holly king forms. I decorate my home with lights and with holly and ivy and mistletoe and evergreens and other herbs sacred to the season. Of course, no Christians would do that, would they? Witches have been doing that long before Jesus was born, and the Catholics made sure it got into the mainstream of what is called Christianity. All right? Then she goes on and explains another one that's interesting is Ostera, how she celebrates the spring festival. I color eggs with friends. 
and uh, divine choices for new growth and so forth, and uh, the spirit of the egg and the rabbit, the consort of Ostera, the goddess. Easter, you ever hear of Easter eggs? Easter bunny came from witchcraft. I don't know if I'm a witch. Do I have an affinity for those things? If I do, I'm practicing witchcraft, de facto and in essence. Okay? And she explains all the Sabbaths here. Sawin, Yule, uh, Candle Mass in February. It's called Groundhog's Day as well. Uh, spring Equinox, which is Ostera, first day of spring. Beltane, which is May 1st. Uh, the summer solstice, or midsummer, called Letha. Uh, August, uh, Lamas, or Lunasa. Of course, that's the uh, harvest festival of the witches. The fall equinox, or Mabon, and then back to Samhain again, the wheel of the year that turns. They call it the wheel of the year, and they also call it the wheel of fortune. The wheel of fortune. Vanna White. <clears throat> okay. And then she goes on and explains how the gods and goddesses visited her and, and invested her with power. Every paragraph starts with, I am pagan, I am pagan, I am pagan, I am pagan. And she embraces Mother Earth and all of her concepts. I don't have time to read every bit of it. If you're interested in this, I can get you a copy. <clears throat> Same thing here, telling about how uh, spirits came in and prevented her being raped and, and taught her how to honor the other gods and goddesses of nature and just all this Mother Earth stuff. He, this came from Marian Prison. And you'll notice the Office of Religious Services, there are 13 different symbols here. Total of 13. You can count them if you want to. Here it's telling how they have approved private worship practices for Wiccans. They are allowed in the prisons to have... This was sent to me by an inmate. Thank God we have 3,000... 800 newsletters going to inmates. The last trumpet newsletter. Anyway, these inmates are telling here about, uh, by the chaplain, that they can have a book of shadows, a protective covering for the book of shadows, an altar cloth, a bowl or chalice, a cordon, a talisman bag. It also says they can have tarot cards a picture of a, of a ceremonial knife, an atame, a picture up to three to five inches long, candles and or incense. It tells the eight Sabbaths that they can celebrate them and they can observe 13 special days called esbets. And this chaplain couldn't spell worth anything. He said to cross it out a few times and he couldn't, for some reason, could not spell esbet. He slaughtered it every time. But in the prisons, they're authorized to do all of this. It's considered an accepted religion. Here are their days. It says accepted by the chaplain, February 24th. The Sabbaths and the Esbets, meetings and ritual. And there they all are. So that isn't doing our prison system any good, is it? All right? This was a brochure. I'm sure Sister Pat knows what... Uh, this is, she's seen that too. Salem puts that out every year. You open the flyer and you'll find things advertised like rituals put on by the Sisters of Eternal Damnation, sponsored by the Lutheran Church and Baptist Church and different ones. The, it's all, and on the side of the police cars, the fire engines, the water tower, everything, they all use that same image of a witch and they are proud of it. If you ever go to Salem, you'll be shocked. This came from UW Oshkosh, a student newspaper called Praxis. Notice that peace symbol? That actually is the V for the Roman numeral 5, representing the five points of the hexagram, earth, wind, water, fire, and spirit. That's the V symbol. It means the same thing as the Roman numeral 5. There's Stonehenge under a, an eclipse of a moon and so forth, lunar eclipse. And in the middle is an image drawing down the power. Now, this I have to make time for. This came from a Christian school, folks. A Christian school, an activity book. It says, 
All Saints Day is known as the Day of the Dead. It is a feast day and not a sad affair. The families go to cemeteries and have parties. Food and drink are offered to the departed relatives. Think of that. As well as to the party goers. Bakers sell special death bread, which is decorated with skulls of icing and sugar coffins. These breads are eaten in large quantities among the graves. All Saints Day is a day to celebrate with some dead friend or relative. How would you like your child going to a uh, Christian school like that? All right? If possible, here's the assignment. Go to a nearby cemetery and do one tombstone rubbing. If it's not possible to do a rubbing, sketch what you think the person looked like in the frame below. Try to find out more about the family or the person. So you're visualizing and drawing the picture here. Look at the date of death. What was happening in history at that time? Check newspapers, etc. If you can find enough information, draw a simple family tree. Quite an assignment for a Christian school, huh? Cathedral of St. John the Divine. Notice what they're advertising. Winter solstice celebration. Celtic soprano, gospel singer, um, 18 African-American dancers and drummers, three sixes, 18. Now, I stood in that cathedral, and I saw they had a female Christ on a cross. They had a skeleton on a cross, representing that Jesus rotted on the cross. I got so incensed, no pun intended, that I walked outside, stood in front of the place. My wife was there, too. I lifted up my hands. I said, Lord God, in Jesus' name, let the fiery judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah come on this wicked, blasphemous place. Thirteen days later, or pardon me, 33 days later, that Masonic number, 33 days later, we had this. Landmark Cathedral in flames. And some of their most sacred tapestries were burned to cinders. That was God's doing. He waited 33 days and let them have it. All right? We should thank the retailers for bringing us together. Uh-huh. Okay. That was in a newspaper, a mainstream newspaper. Okay? Two things are required to practice witchcraft, music, and astrology. This is Jinx Dawson, famous from that rock group Coven. They did that One Tin Soldier song, you know. Go ahead and hate your neighbor. Go ahead and cheat a friend. Do it in the name of heaven. It, you'll be justified in the end. There won't be any trumpet blowing on the judgment day, but on the bloody morning after, one tin soldier rides away. That's all witchcraft jargon. All rock music from the 60s was a spell, a witchcraft spell put to music. Astrology, the 12 signs of the zodiac. So here you've got them. Uh, Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, Virgo, Libra, Scorpio, all the way through. Uh, Sagittarius, Capricorn, Aquarius, Pisces. So people, they believe, are born under one of these signs. Wherever the sun happens to line up with the earth through that sign, that's when you were born. Uh, there's one that isn't on there, the sign of pistachio, the nut. Okay? This is the horoscope for the age of Aquarius. It forms a six-pointed star. Notice how the planets line up. When the moon is in the seventh house and Jupiter aligns with Mars, peace shall guide the planets and love shall steer the stars. This is the very date when the age of Aquarius started. Remember that song, Aquarius? All right. This is the date, January 23rd, 1997, 1235 p.m., New York City. The planets lined up to form a hexagram over the city of New York, ushering in the age of Aquarius. Gaia, mind. Gaia is a Greek word for Mother Earth. Here is Charlotte, North Carolina. We're just about out of time here, but Charlotte is laid out in four wards uh, in witchcraft manner in a diamond shape. And this is drawn because a Coven meeting would be held at the address of 35 degrees, 8 minutes. The Ace of uh, Pentacles right here tells us the, what the password is. This was drawn by a witch. They'll do entire cities and cast spells on them. 
That's Charlotte, North Carolina. And finally, the scripture tells us, how much time do I have? All right, good. We'll just make it. Okay. Acts 19, 13 through 20. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them, which had evil spirits, the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preacheth. And there were seven sons of one Siva, a Jew, and chief of the priests, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are ye? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus, and fear fell on them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also which used curious arts brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Hallelujah. We're going to close on that thought and with prayer. And God help you. If you're involved in any of this, you can repent. God will save you. Amen. Father in heaven, all who are watching this, wherever they're watching it, save their souls, O oh Lord. Draw them out of the darkness. Deliver them, Lord, from the effect of evil spirits. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Let there be a great repentance and forsaking of evil. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.